have a, a sense that God wants to activate one of the gifts in the body tonight. And it's one we don't talk a lot about, but in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Paul's writing and he says, And God has placed in the church first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles. Some translations say workers of miracles. I just got a sense this week that the Lord wants to activate workers of miracles in our midst. And so if you, if that's you, I want to invite you to stand. If you believe that God has put that gift on your life, I want you to stand. And if you have had prophetically that declared over your life, I want you to stand. And begin to stretch out a hand towards the people around you. Begin to lay a hand on people that are standing right now, church. And let's begin to pray that the Spirit of God, go ahead, start praying. That the Spirit of God himself would come and activate the gifts of miracles. The gifts of miracles. Yeah, Lord, we just ask you, Spirit of God, come and put grace on these gifts, Lord. We ask for miracles to fall through these hands, Lord. Lord, as people even walk into the room, miracles happen, Lord. God, we thank you for kids, little kids that are going to walk into school and miracles will happen, Lord. God, we pray for all the kids over there in the kids' wing, Lord. And we just say, let the miracle workers arise, Lord. Let the young ones, Lord. Yeah, God, and our promise is that we will honor, we will honor the workers of miracles, Lord. We will give them a place. We will give them a place. We won't be critical. Lord, we'll honor the miracles, even as Jesus honored the miracles in his day. Lord, we honor the miracles. We honor the workers of miracles in our midst. And we say, Spirit of God, come breathe. Come breathe on these gifts, Lord. Come breathe on them, we pray. We ask you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do it, God. Do it, God. <laughs> Let's have, let's have testimonies of people walking into the room at work and miracles are happening. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. I get to talk about a topic tonight that uh, is more of a pastoral message. It's not one of my typical messages. Praise the Lord. And um, I want to talk about stewarding our encounters. We're people of encounters. I'll try that again. We're people of encounters. We're people who encounter God. We're people who make room and place in our lives to meet with God. And God is so wonderful that he meets with us. How many of you in the last year have had an encounter with God? Yeah. Some people say God doesn't encounter people anymore like he used to. The good news is that's not true. Got a room full of people saying otherwise. That God encounters his people. He wants to encounter you and he wants to encounter me. And yet sometimes he doesn't show up when I like him to. Amen. Yeah, we don't control encounters, but we certainly influence them. God says, he says, draw near to me and I'll. Yeah, there is a part that we play. In our encounters. Wow. All right, get hang on ahead of myself here. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to Joshua 4, 1 through 9. I'm going to read a little bit of scripture here. And then we're going to jump into some really practical aspects of being people who steward our encounters. Here we go. Joshua 4, 1 through 9. And by the way, let me set the context, the table for us. Moses has just died. God established Joshua as the new leader of Israel, 
And they're near the Jordan River getting ready to cross. Jericho's nearby. Joshua, who was a spy, correct? Himself sent two spies. Moses sent 12. Joshua sends two. Hmm. Interesting. To search out Jericho, they meet Rahab and form an alliance with her. God gives specific instruction for the people to follow the Ark of the Covenant through the Jordan as they cross. What did the Ark of the Covenant represent? God's tangible presence and power. It's a good thing to follow. So Joshua gives specific orders to follow the ark through the river. God stops the Jordan so the nation crosses on dry land. Say dry land. This is a complete miracle. And as the nation has crossed, God gives final instructions before this scene ends. Here we go. Verse 1. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder. These were not small stones if you're putting it on your shoulder. Just a small comment there. <clears throat> Each of you take up a stone on your shoulder according to the number of tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. <clears throat> Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are here or there to this day. Wow. What a scene. God's doing a miracle. And right smack dab in the middle of the miracle. You know what God's thinking about? He's thinking about how are we going to steward this to the other generations? That ought to hit us. Right in the middle of a corporate encounter, God's attention goes to how are we going to steward this through the generations? I find that fascinating. God's concern about the living story of a God who encounters his people. And he's so concerned that he actually orders and scripts how it's going to be told. He says, tell your children what I did. I don't think we steward our encounters well enough. I don't think we tell our kids the stories enough where God showed up in our life. I'm curious what a modern day altar looks like. I'm curious. I don't actually know. I don't actually know what the modern day equivalent is of a pile of stones. Do we put it in our backyard? Front yard? Side yard? On the mantle? What do we do? How do we steward the encounters that you're having and that I'm having? Moments where God touches your life, speaks to you, shows up in your early morning time with him, shows up in the word as you're weeping because your heart's coming on fire because of what's happening in the word. How do we steward these encounters? 
Well, why do we have encounters? We have encounters because God's real and he loves his people. And he wants to show himself that he's real. Encounters are when the Spirit of God makes God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit real to us. Encounters are an inbreaking of heaven itself to the here and now, meeting us where we are and pulling us into the heart of God. You can argue with an intellectual theory about God being real. And many of us have. And there's a place to wrestle intellectually. Amen? What you won't wrestle with is that time that you encountered God. You won't wrestle with that because you know you didn't do that. You didn't fall on the floor if you fell on the floor. You didn't have that vision if you had a vision. You didn't have that fire burning inside you as you read the word like that day that that happened. You cannot encounter. You cannot argue with an encounter. And our world needs to see encounters. So whether it's a vision, a dream, being touched by the Lord, time in his word, inspiration, the spirit of God coming upon you in power, it doesn't really matter what the encounter is. The point is, is how are you going to steward it? How are you going to pass this along to the next generation in your life? Amen. Amen. So we value encounters around here. Yeah, it's true. We do. We make time for it. We make room for it. How many of you know that we value what you value, you'll make time for? Yeah, we value food. We make time for food. By the way, you are all looking a lot thinner these days. <laughs> Love it. Good job. Who's ready to get beyond fasting and into feasting? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We value encounters around here. You know why? Because God values them. God values encounters. The Bible is actually a story, a book of encounters. People, very few characters in the Bible didn't have an encounter with the Lord. Think about it. You got Moses, a burning bush. That's an encounter. Right? Exodus 3. You got Solomon. I love Solomon's story. It says God met him while he was dreaming. Wow. Wow. And it changed his life. It changed Israel's life. Isaiah encountered the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. I saw the Lord seated on his throne. Isaiah received an assignment. Who will go for us? Isaiah said, I'll go. Sometimes we get assignments in our encounters. Skipping ahead again. (laughs) Yeah, keep doing that. Paul He encountered the Lord on a road. Good thing he wasn't driving a car. I could have been gnarly. Driving 75, I mean 85. No, I'm just kidding. Can you imagine Paul, modern day encounter, driving? It'd be terrible. Thank God you did it thousands of years ago. I was riding a donkey or whatever he was riding. But Paul was consecrated for the Lord's service in an encounter. Whoa. Peter had a vision of a dream about animals. What a random thing to have an encounter about. But it was a huge doctrinal shift in the day. Pulled them out of the law and what was permissible to eat. And God said to Peter, don't call what I have call okay, not okay. Wow, we could go on and on and on about the encounters people of God have had. So what do encounters mean? Well, first of all, they don't mean that we're more important than others. Can I get an amen? If you have encounters, it's awesome. Doesn't mean you're better than everybody else. Let's get that on the table quickly. It doesn't mean you're more special than other people. You're all special, by the way told you this is a pastoral message. You're all amazing and you're all special. (laughs) Let's just establish that now. But it doesn't mean you're on some hierarchy of being better or more special than the people next to you who aren't encountering the Lord. 
I've been that guy in the line where everybody's getting prayed for and people are falling over like salami, you know, like, wow, this is, and I've been that guy. I've been that guy who like, you can hear the bodies going and then like nothing's happening to me and then it's like skipped me. It's like, I can test your, can test some insecurities inside of you. What's wrong with me right now? You know? So when we encounter the Lord, it doesn't mean we're better than the other people. Amen? All right. Um, It may mean, sorry, it doesn't mean you're more spiritual. Let's don't let our encounter culture create an unhealthy hierarchy. Let's don't do that. Let's, Let's be more mature than that. Let's call ourselves higher. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you're more spiritual than other people. All right, let's get to the fun things. It may mean... That God's getting your attention. How many of you have had an encounter with the Lord and God was getting your attention? Yeah, he was turning your face to see something that he wants you to see. Yeah, God may be getting your attention. I think he got Paul's attention, and I know he got Moses' attention. Absolutely. It may mean that God's filling you with his grace and his love. Many of my encounters with the Lord have been a good father filling his son with his love and nothing more. There wasn't a meaning in it. There wasn't an assignment in it. There wasn't him getting my attention. It was simply a good father loving his son. And I think all of us need those encounters with him. Encounters don't mean everything. They mean something, but they don't mean everything. And we we got to be careful we don't become encounter chasers. You ever heard of the storm chasers? People that go all over the Midwest chasing that tornado, and they got the cameras and stuff. Well, there's encounter chasers too. I've met a few. Wonderful people, by the way. Yeah, I mean that. Wonderful people. But let's don't become encounter chasers. Let's become people of the word. Let's become people of godly character. Hello. Let's become people who cultivate deep community. Let's be people of depth. Let's don't be the people running from place to place looking for the next spiritual high. Let's find him in the secret place. Let's find him in our house church with each other. Let's find him in the prayer sets. Let's find him in the whispers and in the shouts. Amen. Let's meet with him as we gather in community, sharpening one another. I think this is God's heart for us in our encounters. Amen. Encounters may signal a transition. Oh, it's right up there. All of them at once. Okay, that's great. It's all good. Sorry. I I wasn't meant to be snarky. Um, I am ending my fast tonight, so just give me a little grace. Um, They can signal a transition. I remember about 18 years ago, one of the encounters I had with the Lord. I was in a cabin all by myself. Me, the Lord, and a wood-burning stove. And it was wintertime in Alaska. It was cold. And I'm sitting there. I've been there about six hours. And all of a sudden, the father spoke. And he said these words. He said, get ready. I'm bringing you into a season of transition. So simple. I dropped my pen because I was writing in my journal. And I knew the father had spoken. I looked around to make sure no human had entered the cabin. No human there. Didn't hear it with my ears, but heard it with my ears. The ears of my heart. Well, lo and behold, we were living in Alaska at the time, and a year later, we were living in Idaho. Why? The father spoke to a son and told him it was time for transition. Transition's happening. 
Uh, they, encounters may also reveal an assignment he's giving you. So, yeah, this story is about eight years ago. I was at a transition point in my own career. I had been counseling for a while. Um, it had been going mostly well, and I had a, just a couple of really hard things happen. I remember I was, in a, I was in a ministry school setting at the time, and I was just laying before the Lord. We were worshiping, and I was like, Lord, I don't have to do this anymore. I can do other things, and, but I, ultimately I just want to know what, what you want me to do. And I started having a vision, and in this vision I saw, I saw hearts, and on these hearts were, were labels, labels that people in the world and the enemy had put on people's hearts. And I saw, I saw injuries, and I saw, I saw damaged places of these hearts. And I saw in my spirit this vision where I saw the hand of the Lord come down. It was like he was erasing all those things off of people's hearts. And as I sat there, I'm like, Lord, what's the picture? And he's like, this is part of what I've called you to. Part of what I've called you to is to help people get out of their old story and into their new story. And so I came out of that with an assignment. Okay, I'm not giving up counseling. (laughs) I started my practice a month later, and it was called New Story Counseling and Coaching. And for about the next six years, I watched the Lord do exactly that. I watched the goodness of a father remove hurts and labels that the world and people had put on people's hearts and watch the Lord take people out of their old story and into the new story that God has for them. But that day was an assignment for me. It was so clear. That encounter absolutely spoke to me about my next season in the Lord. They also may be about consecration bringing you into a season of hiddenness. Paul had a season of hiddenness. He talks about in Galatians 1, 12 and 17 through 18, he talks about being literally being taught by Christ himself for three years. Talk about a season of hiddenness when there's nobody else around teaching you, but Jesus himself is teaching you. Wow. Three years in Arabia. Most of our growth happens in the valleys, by the way. As good as the mountaintops are, Most of our real growth happens in the valleys. That's what I've found. Which is so beautiful because if you think of it, we don't really grow things on the top of mountains. Even the natural makes sense. The fertile places are the valleys. The fertile soil is the valley. And guess what? Rivers don't run at the top of mountains. They run in valleys. And if you're in a valley, if you're in a time where you're not having encounters, it's okay. You're in a fertile valley right now. And I guarantee you the Lord's up to tremendous work in your life. In his sustaining river, the presence of God will sustain you in this valley that you're in. Lean into that valley. Own it. Roll with it. Because so much growth happens in the valleys. Amen? Amen. So stewarding our encounters, our encounters may be for other people's benefit. That's a really important one. We live in the age of me and my. And we can easily think our encounters are only for us. This is what Joshua's story points out so great. It says, in the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? God had a plan. This encounter was not just for the people that were present that day. They were for descendants, children, grandchildren, all the way to us, descendants today. What if, what if our encounters are not just for us? What if they're for people around you? I think they are. Tell your children, God said, about how God did a miracle for you. Our encounters aren't just for us. They're for our kids and our grandkids also. I was, um, 
I was on vacation a few years ago with Tisha, and we had shipped all the kids off, and it was our, our few days, just the two of us, and it was awesome. And um, we decided to have half a day where we could just read separately, and so I'm over there reading, just loving it, journaling, just looking at the ocean, looking at the sand, just like, oh, Lord, <laughs> this, this is awesome. And, um, and so we decided to meet for lunch, and so we're at lunch, and Tisha walks in, and I can, I can tell something's happened to her. And she, I go, hey, how, how are you doing? She's like, I just had an encounter with the Lord. I was like, wow, underneath that little hut with all the branches? She's like, yeah. And she goes, she starts telling me the encounter she had. She's having this encounter with the Lord. She's crying. She's the whole thing, man. God's touching her life. And the Lord shows her two college-age young women that were sitting nearby. And the Lord says, go over and, go over and talk to them. So she does. She goes over there. They both get saved right there on the beach. And so then we're at lunch, and she starts telling me the encounter that she had. Pretty soon, I'm having the encounter with her. Pretty soon, I'm weeping. I'm sobbing. So this encounter was not just for her. It was for other people. There was three other people that were having radical encounters with Jesus because she decided to pull other people in to her encounter. So I... I don't think our encounters are just for us. In fact, I feel like as we share our encounters with people, it's going to actually pull people into our encounters. The encounter that Jesus is having with you, other people are going to start to get them as well. And I want to say this. Don't be surprised if people are a little bit skeptical. But what I saw, I saw for us was this, that as we shared our encounters, some people might be like, it's a little odd, but okay, we'll, we'll go with that. The very people who are skeptical are going to be the very ones testifying later about what that encounter did for them and how that started a trickle effect of encountering the Lord themselves. So as you share your encounters, which you're going to be doing more and more, wink, wink, is, um, is, yeah, don't be surprised if there's skepticism. It's okay. Watch what God does with those. Amen? Amen. All right. So some practical ways we can steward encounters. Here we go. Number one. Oh, we got Good job, guys. Write them down. Record them. It's hard to share something with accuracy that you forgot. Write them down. Record them. Number two. Inquire of the Lord for understanding them. Ask the Lord, Lord, what does this mean? What did this mean this morning when I encountered you in my secret place with you? Number three, bring them into community. Hello. That's an important one. Invite others to process with you. I can't tell you how many times Tisha and I have done this. We've just invited other people in. I don't invite everybody in, but a few. And it's amazing what happens. I was just at a coffee the other, time, the other day with a group full of men. And I shared something the Lord that I was processing with the Lord that he was speaking to me about. And one of the guys just said, oh, yeah, that kind of reminds me of this, this, and this. And I sat there stunned. Their comment actually unlocked insight in my own heart that I didn't have. I, was so, I told him later, I'm like, I am so thankful you said that. I, I actually did not make that connection in my own heart until you said that. There's power in sharing our encounters with each other. God will give you greater insight from the people around you as you do that. And then share them as you're led to. They may be for future generations. You may have an encounter today that wrecks your kids at the right time. I remember my grandparents. They were wonderful people of faith. And they had an encounter with the Lord in their 50s. And they were so marked by the Lord that they decided to radically commit their ways to God. And I always remember walking into Grandma and Grandpa's house. There was this, this old wooden plaque on the wall, and it was Joshua 24, 15. Choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I remember being a young kid looking at that. 
staring at that. And I know the Lord used that in my life. How will you display your encounters where you've been marked by the Lord? And how will your children and your grandchildren be watered and nurtured by that living legacy in the kingdom? All right, last point. What if I'm not having encounters? Yeah, we don't control encounters from the Lord. We don't twist our God's arm. We don't beg, plead, and then he gives us one. But we do influence them. So here's a few things that have helped me. Number one, check your hunger level. If, if we're not hungry, what did I write down? <laughs> Better say this carefully. If we're not hungry, we might not be pulling on heaven for help. Sometimes we're just full of other things. Sometimes our hunger is being nurtured and fed by other things. And so it doesn't mean your hungry heart guarantees an encounter with the Lord, but it certainly helps. Certainly helps. Amen? Number two, get around people who are encountering the Lord. It's not as fun when they're already up there. It's okay. It's not as, say it again, Justin, get around people who are encountering the Lord. Get around people who are having encounters with God and watch what happens. The fire that's on them gets on you. The hunger that's on them gets on you. Yeah, hungry hearts produce more hungry hearts. Amen? Amen. Ask the Lord if there's anything getting in the way. I've had seasons where long stints where I was not encountering the Lord. And I would be like, Lord, is there anything I'm not seeing here that's getting in the way? For me, uh, judgment. The way my personality is, I like things really well organized. And sometimes I can get a little out of sorts in my brain and accidentally start to judge things. Not people necessarily, but things. And so I have to check my heart around judgments. And the Lord may be inviting you to check your heart around judgments. And also issues in our covenant relationships. There's a scripture that Paul says. He says, you know, make sure that you, husband and wife, that you're getting along and that your relationship's right so that your prayers are answered again. That's how serious God takes covenant relationships. Is I don't, I don't want to think like God's up there going, nah, 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 but he's, he's alluding to something. Check your covenant relationships. Make sure they're on point. Make sure there's nothing in the way. Amen? And then check our spiritual alignment. We're body, soul, and spirit. God is spirit. We connect with him in spirit. We have a soul. We have a personality, we have a will, we have emotions, we have a mind, we have a way of thinking, a mindset. And sometimes we can be so oriented to the body or oriented to the soul that we're not really picking up on things that God's tracking spiritually with us. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So the Bible talks about, you can read about it a little more in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but this idea of the carnal man who is really body, then soul, then spirit. Carnal man, carnal woman, uh, is really body-oriented. The desires of the flesh, the desires, uh, appetites of my body, like hunger, (laughs) um, and other things. Right? That's a carnal person where the body is at the hierarchy of you. It's the command center of you. Also the natural man, which is more of a soul in hierarchy, uh, where it's my mind. And I, I think this can be both mind and emotions, but also for a lot of people, it's the mind. Meaning if, if my mind is in charge of everything else, then I'm going to be limited in what I can encounter from a spiritual God. Because my mind can't fully wrap around things like, how is that bush burning and not being consumed? 
So many times our mind actually needs to be submitting itself to our spirit. Amen. Then the spiritual man, this is the man or woman whose spirit is in charge. Spirit is the CEO. Why? Because God, who is a spirit, lives inside your spirit. And when God, who is a spirit, is living in your spirit, talking to your soul, discipling your soul, telling your mind to get in line, Chris Valentin says it really well. He says, the mind is a terrible master, but a wonderful servant. And the spiritual man has trained the mind to think through and to be powerful as a thinker, to emote well, to love well through emotions, and to receive love through emotions. So sometimes, if we're not having encounters, it can be that we've gotten out of spiritual alignment. And we need to ask God, and we need to partner with God to find that place back to be in a spirit, soul, and body. Amen? Amen. I'm wrapping up. I felt like tonight that there's a place at the altars for people who, it's just been a minute or two since you've had an encounter with the Lord. And I also felt like there was people that maybe have never had an encounter with the Lord. And I'm not going to promise you an encounter with the Lord tonight. But what I did see was I saw as people gathered and began to pray that the grace was going to come on you for a season of having your own encounters with the Lord. And I saw that for not a few of us, but for many of us tonight. And so I just want to invite you to stand, all of us. And if you're on the ministry team, that'd be awesome if you come down and Let's ask the Lord together to make us a people who steward our encounters well. Amen. Lord, we just ask you, we ask you, Spirit of God, to continue to pour yourself out amongst us. In the secret place, in the quiet place, Lord, in the in the whisper and in the noise, Lord. We thank you that you're showing up in prayer sets. You're showing up in house churches. You're showing up in kids' ministry. Lord, you're showing up at our workplaces. Lord, you're showing up. And you're showing off how good you really are. And Lord, we just em- we embrace being people of encounters. And Lord, would you just help us to pass them along to the next generation? Lord, to not hold them or hide them, Lord but to be bold and courageous with what you're doing in our lives. We invite you, Spirit of God, to come and rest on us. We thank you. You love us enough to encounter us as your sons and daughters. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I just want to invite you to come down, get prayer. God has some radical encounters for you to have. He has stories for you to pass along to your kids. He has moments in quiet. He has moments when it's loud and thunderous. But tonight, I just saw grace coming on you to kick off a season of encounters. And for some of you, you've had them, but they were a long time ago. And the Lord's saying, I want to put my grace back on you tonight. So I want to invite you down. If that's you, come on down front. We're going to end the service in prayer. Ministry team, you're welcome to come down. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. We bless you. I bless you. We'll see you next week. I love you all.